Great. So we shouldn't be measuring or counting or thinking too much about time, but we're already on the fourth evening and it's just flying by so quickly. And um, only three full days after this, isn't it? Almost full days. So now is the really interesting part of the retreat. And this is the part where we can start thinking a little bit about the end. Maybe I shouldn't have brought it up, but it's actually the time to really preserve your energy and to keep the momentum going. It can be tempting at this time in a retreat to start thinking about what you're doing next or how it's gone so far and worrying about the time you have left, but you actually have so many, many moments to get enlightened or even many moments just to make a little bit of peace. So even forget about the enlightenment, you've got a lot of moments to practice well. So, and also for those listening live, um, yeah, see if you want to join in with the meditation, we'll give a little Dhamma reflection. And tonight's theme is on Sati, but because Ajahn Brahma and myself, we haven't actually talked together about what the other's teaching, but we seem to be teaching basically the same things. And if there's any, uh, what do you call it, um, overlap there, that's just synchronicity, a kind of synchronicity, and hopefully it works out okay. But um, because today Ajahn did talk a lot about sati in terms of the satipatthanas, I thought I'd give a, a slightly different angle on the teachings of mindfulness. So you will see what we're going to do soon. <laughs> but I wanted to give just first of all a general introduction to the theme of sati, which means mindfulness, as you know. Um, I think that's probably the best translation that we have in English, although kindfulness is much more preferable to me. But as an Indriya, as one of these spiritual faculties, mindfulness is a natural outcome of developing some confidence in the Buddha's teachings, some confidence in the path, and also learning to direct the mind energetically. So we have some energy that starts arising as a result of that confidence. That energy comes along with a certain degree of happiness. And we're learning to meet the present moment in a wholesome way meet it with kindness, meet it with patience, meet it gently. And mindfulness is more than just being aware, as you've already heard from Ajahn Brahm, it's actually the sixth factor of the Eightfold Path. And so it implies at least some understanding, some appreciation of suffering, the fact that there is inevitable suffering in life. And it's part and parcel of being born. You know, it's inevitable that once we've been born, there's going to be aging, sickness, and old age and death. You know, the separation from the loved, association with those we don't love very much. And of course, not getting what we want. This is really the problem, the root cause, isn't it? Not getting what we want. The fact that we have that wanting at all. And that wanting, of course, is born of delusion. So mindfulness already carries with it a certain amount of wisdom and also the second path factor, the factor of right motivation or wise motivation, wise ways of relating to life and wise ways of relating to our mind is also an aspect of wisdom, of course. And that helps us to um, meet the moment in an ethical way. Yeah? So we learn to move the mind in a wholesome direction, to direct it to places that we actually have um, a chance for wisdom to arise. So that's why mindfulness of, say, shooting an arrow, or shooting a gun is not really mindfulness, not mindfulness in terms of right mindfulness. It's certainly going in the opposite direction of any kind of enlightenment. So I really like Bhikkhu Bodhi's definition of mindfulness. He said it's basically um, that aspect of the mind that brings into focus the present moment without what he calls cognitive clutter of preferences, judgments, or reactivity, reactive thought. And it sustains a kind of balanced attention on the present moment for long enough to really bore into its nature, to actually see the nature of reality. So it's not just being aware, it's being aware in order for wisdom to arise. And uh, Shaila Catherine, one of my other teachers, has a nice um, way of understanding it too. And she said it's um, the willingness to connect again and again with a kind of gentle perseverance to meet the present moment without willpower or force. And the uh, quote that I wrote down from her goes, 
just as a light illuminates an object, but does not have the force to dent, to change or alter it. So mindfulness illuminates, but does not change or manipulate experience in the present. Yeah? So we're not denting our experience. We've got this mindfulness that just shines a light on things, but actually lets them be, lets them alone. And I wanted to just go over a little bit more um, around the, the right motivation, the right relationship to whatever arises in the mind. Um, the relationship of kindness, of compassion, of non-ownership or letting go. Because these are also what Ajahn Brahm refers to sometimes as making good mental karma, right? We can almost see what arises in the mind as the result of old karma, the result of old actions that we've performed in the past. Maybe actions we can remember, maybe things we forgot about, or even things from a past life, who knows? So that's old karma, you know, whatever's arising in front of you right now is coming from causes. There's very little you can do about those. But what we do have is an opportunity in this present moment to make good karma with what we experience now. And that good karma is basically generating and developing those wise motivations. Yeah. So mindfulness goes along with or is infused by loving kindness. It's not just mindfulness. And that loving kindness helps us to welcome experience, not just to accept it, but actually to embrace it. And get this, this is more radical, even to celebrate it arising. And that even extends to things like panic attacks, believe it or not. You know, of course, when it happens, it can be very distressing to the mind, especially um, based on fear, you know, the most unexpected of times. And the whole body starts to go into a kind of um, heightened state of arousal. The heart might start pounding or sweat might start coming. Or I think somebody said earlier that their hands were getting kind of clammy and cold. And of course, nobody enjoys that experience. And yet at the same time, it's something that's arising in your present moment. And it's something that if you do learn to relate to it wisely, it can be a great teacher for you. So it's not so important to know why it's arising. Sometimes it's impossible to say, <clears throat> but what's really important, the place you do have some influence is how you meet that experience. So can you infuse that mindfulness with a sense of, compassion, yeah, non-harming, gentleness, patience, and this willingness to care. Uh, in some, um, I think Christopher Germer, somebody who did a lot of um, study on compassionate mindfulness or mindful self-compassion, says that the difference between um, compassion and mindfulness or compassionate mindfulness and mindfulness is that mindfulness says, okay, this is unpleasant, this is painful, Maybe this is fearful or scary. And compassion says, how can I meet that? How can I care? What kind of attention is necessary here to soothe myself yeah, or to calm the situation down? And by that, we don't necessarily mean calming the, um, the object down. You know, we might not be able to control that, but we can calm our observation down by seeing where those hindrances are getting in. Yeah. And I also think it's quite interesting to notice that a subtle shift can happen, say, if an experience like a panic attack does arise. <clears throat> What's sometimes um, important, I think, is to acknowledge the person who's having the panic attack. So rather than, again, just putting all the focus on the object, the subject, you, yourself, becomes the main thing to care for at this time. Because until we really see through non-self, we do have a sort of, mm, what can we call it, conventional way of describing this body and mind as a self, as a being. And sometimes that being needs care, you know. It is real in the sense that you feel, you suffer, right? You experience pain, you experience distress. And sometimes rather than, you know, going back to your previous meditation object or thinking what happened, you know, I was just getting deep. The thing that's right in front of you now is the panic. And the thing that needs care is you, yourself. So we can actually turn that mindfulness with compassion onto ourselves, onto the one that's receiving this painful experience and ask ourselves, what do I need right now? I found a very nice um, 
story from somebody on Facebook. She's one of my Facebook friends. And I asked her just before the session whether I could share it. Her name is Kosan Carla Callahan. And I wanted to say her name because she said that I think she's she could be a Zen practitioner. I'm not sure. Um, maybe even an ordained lay practitioner. She looks as though she may be. And she also has um, had panic attacks. So I'll read out her story because I think it's a really nice example of how mindfulness has the power to help us alleviate the suffering we may go through. So she says, many of you may be aware that I'm no longer able to use my arms and I'm in a wheelchair. Of course, this causes lots of interesting situations. A couple of years ago, I was trapped in a car in a parking lot in a seatbelt. I was unable to get myself out of the seatbelt and had a full blown panic attack. It was very upsetting and difficult for me to deal with emotionally, but it made me very aware that because of the nature of my disease, the chances were that it was going to happen again at some point. So I decided to make it a priority to deal with all my feelings around being trapped so that if it happened again, I'd be prepared. And then this is about a week ago she's writing. So she says, tonight I found myself in a situation where I was by myself without anyone to help me. And I was stuck for about 30 minutes. The other piece which is guaranteed to bring on a panic attack is that I was hot. For me, that's a very difficult thing. The good news is that because of the work I'd done, I still had a panic attack, but I was conscious of what was happening throughout the whole thing and was very aware that I was in control of my response to the situation. I didn't have to descend into terror and catastrophize the situation. The exciting thing is that I proved to myself that I could modulate my visceral response. For me, meditation has been key along with watching my thoughts. So don't give up. If you have something that's a really scary thing for you, decide to overcome it and dismantle that fear. Step by step, you'll do it. I am living proof. So I thought that might be helpful to other people, even if you haven't experienced things like this, there'll be situations in your life that you do feel trapped, either physically, mentally, or both. Emotionally, I'm sure many of us have experienced similar things during lockdowns or during all kinds of situations in our lives. And so the last aspect of the right motivation or, or relationship to what we experience is that um, quality of renunciation. And by renunciation here, we really mean we're not seeking to claim, to own, to possess, <clears throat> even to identify with our experience but we're just learning to make peace with experience and let it be. Yeah, this wonderful word letting be, which is very, very similar to the letting go. And it's from the letting be that letting go naturally happens. When we stop fueling things with our fear, with our craving, with our aversion, then naturally nature just starts to unravel and the process naturally calms and unfolds. So we let nature take its course and on the understanding that things play out are causing to causes and conditions. But what we can do, of course, is learn to watch our minds, learn to see how am I relating to this moment and also the role of thought. Like this lady was saying, you know, she was watching her thinking also throughout that panic attack and probably stopping it from getting out of control. You know, I'm going to be stuck here forever. <laughs> this is never going to end, you know, nobody cares. Who knows where the mind can go? So that's my little introduction on mindfulness, but now I wanted to take it in a slightly different direction and um, talk about another aspect or highlight the aspect of mindfulness that is around recollection and memory. So some places in the suttas, and I think one of them's in the Anguttara, but I forget exactly where, um, the Buddha says that one with um, mindfulness also recollects and memorizes, has a good memory for things that happened long ago. And that's the, the Sanskrit word smriti, which uh, is very similar to mindfulness, means memory, like sati, right? And smriti is the Sanskrit. And um, I used to think, what's that got to do with mindfulness? But the point is that sometimes we know very well what mindfulness is supposed to be. You know, we know where we're supposed to direct it, but we forget to do it, right? 
<laughs> most times we're not mindful it's not because we don't know we should be it's just simply because we've forgotten to regain our mindfulness to regain our presence of mind and as soon as we remember oh you know i'm trying to develop mindfulness i'm trying to cultivate mindfulness as continuously as i can then boom mindfulness is right there you're back in the present and the buddha actually says that one of the causes for mindfulness to develop is associating with people developing mindfulness and if we associate with people who are muddle minded I like that phrase, model minded, <laughs> probably because my mind can get muddled sometimes. So I relate to that. Then uh, it's harder to develop mindfulness. So if you're around other people who are in a spin, in a rush, really busy and just falling all over the place, then, you know, we tend to get caught up, don't we, in that whirlwind a little bit. So that's one aspect of um, memory and recollection. But the other is that there are these other objects of mindfulness called the Anusatis. And these are things like recollecting the buddha's qualities recollecting the dhamma recollecting the sangha yeah the beautiful purity of beings who have developed their hearts so deeply in virtue peace and compassion and then also recollecting our own goodness our own virtue and lastly the one that i want to focus on now is recollection of death maranasati or marananusati in some commentaries i think and oh, I did mean to get the sutta reference. I've written it down, but not the sutta itself. But um, the Buddha talks about it in two places in the Anguttara 6, 19, and 20. And in there, um, the monks come along and the Buddha says, um, You know, um, how do you practice mindful of death, mindfulness of death? And they say, Well, you know, I recollect that who knows, tomorrow I may die. And the Buddha says, no, 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 that's the wrong way to do it. So he goes to the next monastic, maybe it's a bhikkhuni, <laughs> and they, he says, you know, how do you practice it? And they say, oh, I recollect that, you know, I could die this afternoon. Or I could die at the end of my meal. This might be my last meal. And the Buddha says, no, oh, no, no, that's not really a good practice of, of recollection of death. So he goes to the next person. Let's say it's a nun now, an enlightened nun, perhaps. And uh, he asks her and she says, I recollect that I could die at the end of this morsel, morsel of food. Just this one morsel of food could be my last. And he's, he, he congratulates her. He says, yes, that's right. And another person says, I could die at the end of this next breath, of this breath. I could die at the end of this breath. Maybe this is my last breath in, my last breath out. So he praises that kind of recollection of death because it really can be and it will be that quick when it happens no one knows right we can die at any time and it's always going to be unexpected you know I mean perhaps for some people with a chronic terminal illness there may be a little bit more preparation but the fact that we don't know when it's going to happen really encourages and I think shows us the necessity of practicing now and so this is just another tool in our box that we can have to learn to skillfully um, use our minds in ways that overcomes fears and that also surprisingly stimulates a sense of gratitude and appreciation for life because it's really when we understand death that life comes into sharper relief you know we're actually aware that wow right now I'm awake I'm alive my faculties are intact you know I'm breathing freely okay maybe I'm losing the use of my arms or the use of my legs Maybe I've got chronic fatigue. Maybe my stomach is full of parasites, in my case, <laughs> and lots of other things. Um, but, you know, all around, this body and mind is good enough, right? Generally speaking, we've got what it takes. We've got a human life, and we've got the chance to bring to mind um, the purpose and the value of this human life and to really see that we're on track with using it the best way that we can because we don't know how much is left. So it arouses energy. It arouses a sense of urgency, a sense of heedfulness, but also I think it can arouse happiness and gratitude, even appreciation for the beauty in our lives, the beautiful people in our lives. And this happened to me because a couple of years ago, uh, 2019, um, I was suddenly looking at the mole that's always been rather weird on my arm. And one day after a friend and I think my mother had seen it and thought it looked a bit bigger than it used to. Suddenly I looked at it and it was bleeding and all black and crusty and just not very nice. 
and I knew immediately this is not good uh, so I was quite fortunate I went um, for a skin test straight away and they told me yeah it looks like a melanoma but of course there was a delay before they had to take it off so in this period of time it was so interesting to see what happened to me mentally you know as somebody who's been practicing for 26 years like quite intensively right and it was really interesting to see that I could be going about my daily business as usual and then suddenly from somewhere deep inside the mind not even at the level of thought I'd remember this thing on my arm and there'd be this kind of visceral wave of fear through my body from sort of foot to my head and I actually would have to ground myself more in my feet because it would just come over me in a way and then I'd remember wow I don't know how long I've got left you know because these things can be um they can move to incurable within six weeks they can move to stage four and then the prognosis is three to five years and this has been changing for like throughout my life so I didn't know that you know, whether it's, I thought it's more than six weeks, right? <clears throat> and at the same time, sometimes when I was around people who came to visit or other meditators who came to sit with me, I felt this overwhelming sense of love and even joy. It, it was a very beautiful feeling. It was the kind of feeling you get, or I get sometimes when I practice metta, you know, a real sense of like open heartedness and just really embracing the person fully, because I guess it just releases any little niggling petty concerns. You know, it gives a perspective, puts things in context and helps us overcome the kind of trivial mind. Of course, the story has a happy ending because it hadn't spread at all. <laughs> I must have caught it just when it went from a very strange mole to a melanoma and uh, I don't know, it looks all right. I got a really cool arm while showing my arm. Uh, can you see that? It's quite a big scar. It's kind of a funky forest nun's arm. So that's my little reminder. But it's interesting to see how I have to intentionally recollect that to bring up that sense of urgency again. Because now I'm kind of blasé. Oh, it's gone now. You know, it's unlikely to come back. And this is the problem, isn't it? We don't really practice until it's too late. So the Buddha actually says that uh, yeah, one of the reasons we don't practice, of course, is because we're afraid to think about death. It's almost as though we think that by thinking about it, we're, you know, tempting it to come on early or something like that. And yet it's not death that's so problematic. It is actually the fear, the resistance, the denial. Yeah, this feeling that we don't want to go near such a topic. We don't want to think about such a thing. And another friend of mine who's Dutch, Oh, sorry, she's German, but she lives in Holland, a very close Dhamma sister. She um, had an experience many, many years ago. She's a meditator. Uh, and she was going along on a bicycle down a hill and suddenly something happened. Maybe she hit a big rock. The bicycle flew over and she found herself headfirst falling down the hill. And she said at the time of, you know, banging the head and she just had this feeling like, yep. Yeah, I could die and I know how to do this. She said she had this really overwhelming sense of kind of a, a feeling of security, now feeling that, yeah, I've done this so many times before. She said it was almost like she just knew, the mind just knew how to die at that time. And I think even now when she remembers that, it gives her great confidence and really great feeling of relief. Same with my experience. I mean, it gave me this sense that, yes, I have lived a life that's worthwhile and I wouldn't have regrets. And that was quite surprising for me, especially because I'm so involved in a very difficult project that sometimes consumes all my energy to the point that I don't have a lot left for my practice, you know, so I think, right? I mean, I'm used to having a lot more time for practice and a really bright mind, but just like someone else commented today, when you're busy all day long and then you go to sit, it's very hard to you know, calm the mind. I don't even try to calm it, I just give it time, but it takes much longer to calm. And uh, even though this is the case, when, when I thought that I might not have much time left, I realized I wouldn't regret a thing. Like most of my life, I've really taken decisions that I stand behind, you know? They may not have always worked out the way I expected, but I did my best. You know, I did make decisions based on what I thought could be of service to others and also to myself. I did commit to practice this path 
and put as much energy into it as I possibly can. Sometimes conditions might not be as conducive as I wish they would be, but according to the conditions, I do my best. You know, I'm not perfect. I have many faults, but I also have many qualities that I've really carefully, diligently cultivated. And for that, I can be happy that I've done my best. Yeah. So what is it that we would do if we knew we had little time? How would you feel about what you've done in your life? How would you feel about the beautiful qualities in your heart? You know, perhaps you'd suddenly realize they're abundant. You know, you've basically lived a very good life. And it's so easy, isn't it, when we think we've got so much time left to think, yeah, but I need to change this, I need to change that, I should be better, I should be more perfect, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, really, if this was your last day or your last evening, wouldn't you be happy with what you've done? You spent the last week of your life on retreat, <laughs> even though you might have had a birthday party or gone out and done a few other things, but you really turned up as much as you could. And you gave your best to this. You gave yourself sincerely with diligence, with energy, with love. So that's really fantastic, isn't it? And that's something you could definitely bring to mind. The Buddha asks us in the 10 recollections, uh, the Pachavekanas for monastics, he says, one of them is, um, the days and the nights are relentlessly passing. How well am I using my time? Yeah. The days and the nights are relentlessly passing. How well are we using our time? So are we putting our energy into things that really matter to us? Or are we wasting it in frivolous pursuits or things that don't really deserve so much of our love and time? You know, our time and our love and our energy is precious. And sometimes we undervalue that, I think. You know, so how can we make sure that we really do dedicate our lives to the things that matter to us and the, you know the people that matter to us as well and moreover how are we using our mind <laughs> right are we dwelling on faults that we see in others are we holding on to grudges and regrets if we are then we need to learn how to forgive learn how to let go because tonight could be the night you know do you really want to die with unfinished business with unresolved resentments or other people you'd like to apologize to, like to ask forgiveness of. If you can't do it personally, maybe they've passed away or it's not safe to do it or you're not quite ready, at least you can make the intention to forgive. You can mentally, you know, allow yourself that, you know, I, my intention, I intend to forgive and I trust myself to the process of forgiveness. I trust that process and I give it time. Yeah. And even if you just start this process in the mind, you can die much lighter <clears throat> without those regrets. In the same way, we can give away physical baggage, right? How many of us hoard things that we really don't need? And there are many charities now, you know, maybe the Red Cross or uh, refugee charities that collect all kinds of things and send them to people who really need an extra pair of socks. Do we really need so many pairs? Do we really need so many shoes? Apparently, people have a lot of shoes or I don't know what else you might have maybe too many books <laughs> sorry I'm just looking at your videos it might not be too many <laughs> but I just saw someone has a lot of books <laughs> I'm sure I also have a lot of books that I actually don't read you know I keep thinking it's a great idea to get another book for the future monastery and then I'm left like lugging it around in a in a backpack so you know why do we have so much stuff that we can't really use right now <laughs> You know, we can give things away. We can give our services away. You know, would you be happy if you died tonight with the service that you've done? Sometimes I remember speaking to my mom years ago and she works with adults with learning disabilities as a speech and language therapist. And she was managing the whole, um, the whole uh, what do you call it, service for North, North Derbyshire um, with a whole team of people under her, like a psychiatrist, art therapist, drama therapist, um psychologists of course and other speech and language therapists and I said you know wow what you do every day is really making a massive difference in these people's lives I mean it's just incredible and I don't know if she ever really reflected on that you know because it becomes just a, a mundane nine to five or if you live in London it's usually something like eight till seven <laughs> in the evening right it's a really long slog but don't waste that time by just sort of feeling terrible, feeling tired. See if you can actually reflect on what you've done that day. 
And if somebody said thank you, or even if somebody smiled, remember it, bring it to mind and feel happy, allow yourself to feel glad. Yeah, There'll be people in your lives that have done things for you that, you know, they'll never know about, right? I'm sure that many of you have received kindnesses from other people <clears throat> and you don't know who these people are, but it made a difference. And in the same way, you'll have done that for many, many people. So another thing that the Buddha asked us to do is reflect that we own our karma in a sense. I asked Ajahn Brahm about this because I said, surely we don't really own anything. And he said, okay, well, that's for someone who's not enlightened. That's for someone who still has a sense of self. But still, at the, again, conventional level, we are the owners of our karma in the sense that we experience the results of every action that we do. Yeah. And the Buddha says, for good or for ill, of that I shall be the heir. We're born of our karma, supported by our karma. I think that's quite interesting. Supported by our karma. Don't get scared because of that. Actually bring up the good stuff you've done. How often do you recollect the beautiful things that you've done, the beautiful qualities in your heart? The more you bring it up, the more you encourage those qualities, right? It's that simile of watering the flowers and not the weeds. I'm sure you all know it, but it's, uh, I think originally Thich Nhat Hanh and Ajahn Brahms elaborated. If you water the flowers, they grow and they eventually just swamp out the weeds. That's anyway, in an ideal world of gardening, eventually the flowers overtake the weeds when you water them. And maybe even the weeds start to have flowers and look beautiful as well. Right? So it's important to do this because every time you recollect on you know, the goodness in your life, you are in a sense creating a stronger groove in the mind. Like it's almost like you're carving out a channel where the mind inclines to again and again. And I remember a quote actually that Ajahn Brahm said that I thought was fantastic. He said, um, the channels for celebrating my own goodness are wide open. The channels for me in my mind for celebrating my own goodness are wide open. For most people, it's the channels for criticism that are wide open. Something like that, he said. And I just thought, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> you know, it's just there's no barrier there at all because it's actually the sense of self that creates the barrier. Right? It's only actions. It's not a doer that does these actions. It's just goodness. So why not celebrate that? So there's more I could say, but I think that reflecting on death can bring us more fully into alignment with life. It can give us a renewed appreciation of life and an in, increased sense of energy and maybe urgency in a good way, in a balanced way, to really take steps on this path and not to waste a moment, not to take any moment for granted, because that can be so easy, especially at this time in the pandemic. There's a lot of lethargy. What's the other word? Languishing. That's apparently quite popular now. It's not quite depression. It's somewhere between depression and boredom. It's a kind of like stagnation, I guess, not really feeling that sort of zest for life. But reflecting on dying brings life more into the present moment and it makes it easier to let go. Yeah. Not only does it make it easier to let go now, but it also, of course, helps us have a good death. And a good death can be something very beautiful, very pleasant even a great relief. So what I thought we could do now, if you wish, is we could do a little death meditation, if you feel up for that. And if at any time it feels scary or uh, not helpful, or it brings up anxiety, then please just fall back to your usual meditation. If anything happens like a panic attack, and you know, I'm not encouraging this. I mean, there's no reason why it should, because this meditation will be very joyful, very beautiful. It will be focusing on the goodness of your life. But just in general, when those things happen, you don't have to continue and push through it. Just go back to yourself and give yourself the compassion that you need, okay? So only do this if it feels good, if it feels pleasant, and if it's conducive to a sense of contentment and letting go. So before you get yourself in your postures, I would actually like to suggest that you try it lying down. It's up to you. You don't have to. <laughs> and if you've got a comfortable place to lie down only, because for me, if I lie flat on the carpet, my hip goes out of joint and I can't actually move my leg. But if you've got like something like a sofa or you could put lots of blankets underneath you, then that might be a good 
way to do it. Of course, the other way is to sit on a chair and lean back on the chair. Yeah, find the comfiest chair that you can. And uh, I'll give you a few moments for that. So unfortunately, I won't be able to lie down because I'll be guiding it. But I lie down when I do this meditation. It makes it more peaceful and more relaxed. Straight away, I want to credit my teachers for this one. It's a combination between a lovely guided death meditation that I've heard Venerable Karunika do. She's a bhikkhuni that I ordained with in Perth and also Ajahn Brahmali, who's another teacher, one of my other Kalyanamittas in Perth. He's Norwegian. I think many of you know him already. Ah, I'm just seeing blank screens. You've already died. Amazing. <laughs> There's no one left. <laughs> Ah, uh, good. But some of you are still sitting up, which is absolutely fine. So, ah, oh, I imagine all your work is done for now. So gently closing your eyes when you're ready. And finding the most comfortable position that you can remain with for the next 20, 25 minutes or so. The kind of position that is restful for you. And if it's comfortable for you, imagine that you don't have much more of this life left. You're lying down or seated, feeling deeply relaxed and at ease. Much of your work is completed. So just notice in the beginning a sense of relaxation coming over you. You may still have things on your to-do list. Perhaps there are places you'd still like to visit, people you'd like to meet. But now, as the time comes closer to your death, you realize these things are really not important at all. This could be your last evening. So all that matters to you now is a sense of contentment and peace. You find it becomes quite easy 
to stay present. To the sensations in the body or to the breath. Because every moment is precious. Any moment could be your last. Someday it will be. And that could very easily be this evening. And with this reflection, you start to remember the goodness of your life. The ways you tried to develop wholesome states of mind. The general direction of your life towards kindness, generosity, truthfulness. The ways that you may have served. Sure, you are not perfect, but nobody is. But in the face of death, it becomes so easy to let go of those little mistakes. And this beautiful feeling of peace and happiness, gratitude for the opportunities that you've had, starts to arise in the mind. You also find it easy to forgive those who may have hurt or harmed you. It makes no sense to hold on anymore. And as you mentally let go, give away, any burdens of grudges or resentments, body and mind feels light, feels free.
if there are people you have yet to forgive. If you wish, you can bring them to mind and mentally seek their forgiveness or let them know your intention to forgive. And you also remember so many dear people in your life who've been your friends, your loved ones, your pets, those who've supported and encouraged you. So many people that you're grateful towards. Now you realize it's time to thank them. You may not see them again, but you have time to just share a moment of gratitude before you go your way. They let you go giving you full permission to be carried on a stream of gratitude and love. And you know they'll be fine. Their karma will support them as yours supports you. So you just share a few moments of gratitude, of love. Before letting them fade from your awareness. And bringing that feeling of gratitude inside. And now, imagine that you're in the last room that you'll ever see. Just lying down or sitting on a simple white bed. Alone with this feeling of gratitude. feeling of peace. The body that's becoming 
very light as you slowly start to slip away from this world. And you start to realize that even though your body feels a little distant, though it's starting to fade, your mind is bright. Buoyed up, supported by all that good karma, all that beauty, purity, and goodness of your life. And you feel an immense sense of Relief. And at this point, you don't really know whether you're alive or whether you've passed on to another place. But your goodness is accompanying you. You realize there was never any need to fear. And you also sense that there's an energy of love, of light around you. A peace that suffuses you, fills your mind. What a relief to be free from the body, to experience such emptiness, freedom and peace.
Inhale very gently. With a light, quiet mind. Start sensing your body again. Body that's deeply relaxed. Notice that you do have another breath. You do you have signs of new life? But now you realize how precious each and every breath really is. And how fortunate you are to have more time. Time to continue cultivating beautiful, wholesome qualities in the mind. And perhaps from the perspective of dying, there are things you'd like to abandon and put down that you don't need to carry through the rest of this life. So in your own time, you might start to wiggle your toes. If you wish, you can stay lying down. And sense how it feels to have this body. And whether there's any peace or perhaps renewed energy in the mind. When you're ready, you can Take three more breaths. And gently open your eyes. Or not. But if you want to hear the Q&A, you might want to sit up to continue meditating. Otherwise, you'll fall to sleep. But if you want to go to sleep, it's okay. <laughs> wow. You're still here. <laughs> Still alive. <laughs> Great. <laughs> that was nice to see all the screens kind of empty and quiet. <laughs> it's a nice meditation if you ever sort of want to change your posture you know it's a good one to do lying down or if it's the afternoon and you sort of want to rest but you sort of you're quite you're not sleepy enough to have a rest then sometimes I listen to that and it's almost like a midway between 
awake and asleep, just very light, yeah. So, <laughs> so, still some direct messages coming to me, is it? Or well, it's from many, it's from many. Okay. Yeah. Okay, the first one I think is, uh, I'm not sure if, I wasn't sure if it was a question or you want me to read it out. I'm not quite sure. Um, but I'll read it anyway, because I think it's nice. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for encouraging me to come on this retreat and for your timely, compassionate email. Okay, I don't know what this refers to, but that's nice. Towards early December, I barely had any confidence I could do this retreat at all. I've been having all kinds of challenges for the first few months and was left burned out between work and not having a safe place to practice in my noisy new home. Even though I've fallen behind in meditation practice, I'm taking heart in practicing compassion, gratitude and good and good humor. Okay. It's a long message. Do you want the rest of it? I'm not sure how, how do people want this message. <laughs> I'm not actually sure if it's uh, meant to be read out. Maybe you can put the names, Rennie, so I know for sure they're from the participants. Okay, not that I'll read your names out, but it just helps me to be confident. Being on this retreat is storing my peace and strength. And the most important question I have these days is how to find some strength without spiraling into anxiety and burnout. When I don't have a stable, quiet space, I can bank on at home to rest or practice. Okay, I think that's the question part. I'm taking to heart what Ajahn Brahm said this morning about creating the causes, not trying to create the results. Much, much love and gratitude to you and Ajahn. Oh, that's great. Yes, I do relate to this part about finding strength without spiraling into anxiety and burnout when I don't have a stable, quiet space. I can bank on at home to rest or practice. That's really tough. I wonder if there's anybody there that you can talk to about this to actually try to explain how you're feeling and ask if they could support you in some way. That would be my first suggestion because I don't think that we should always just make peace with the situation. I think part of making peace is sometimes uh, knowing that we've done the best we could to ask for what we need and to try to bring that about. Um, sometimes people are a lot more willing to uh, find ways to support you than you might give them credit for. They just sometimes don't realize, especially if you're very sensitive and you know do struggle with anxiety and you know your energy is not so hi i mean i'm quite similar it's not that i get a lot of anxiety but my energy these days is very low and i'm actually moving from place to place which i find completely exhausting and i know for myself i have to make a request to have quiet time and a space that i can use on my own um if that's really not possible then maybe you can have at least a place where you put your meditation cushion down even if you can't be guaranteed to be alone. But still, if you keep on returning to that place to meditate and to just close your eyes even, over time, even if there's busyness around you in the same room, you will start to resonate with that place as your place. And I have meditated in many places in India and all across um, Asia when I've been traveling like on buses or in all kinds of places that is not stable or quiet, but I just close my eyes anyway and just go inside because sometimes you need to do that um, and if you do start to go into anxiety and burnout please just listen to your body and you might have to cut down on some of the things you do I mean I'm doing that quite soon I'm going to be cutting down on some of the teachings that I really wanted to show up for but I will be cutting down because how can you really serve if you're not resourced yourself you know, and I think it's also a practice for me to learn that sometimes people may be disappointed, but it's either I disappoint them or I disappoint myself. And in a sense, disappointing myself in the sense of 
um, you know, burning out would mean that I'm absent for much longer <laughs> from being able to serve. So I don't know if I can say much about that because I don't know your exact situation, but I would definitely try asking for what I need, first of all, and then just trying to create a corner or a place that you just claim for yourself somehow. Um, I mean, you can try with earplugs, you can try with maybe practices of metta that can create a kind of force field in a sense around you. They can create a kind of softness around the situation. And also people do pick up on those vibes. So that might help as well. And people might quieten down. There was some kind of study done in a London park where you had a couple of people meditating and there was a group of women, I think, doing exercises. And they showed that um, these people were meditating just very close by to the women doing exercises. And after about five, 10 minutes, the exercising started to get much more um, calm <laughs> so i mean not intentionally they didn't even realize the effect of the meditators on their energy so that can happen as well okay so we've got a few questions coming thank you for supporting us through the retreat and illuminating the dhamma for us i would like to ask where is the boundary between caring for oneself during a panic attack and observing the panic attack from the perspective of not me, not mine, not a self. So I wouldn't really think of it as a boundary. I would more think of it in terms of perhaps where the mind inclines. Sometimes it may be that you're very good at observing objectively from the perspective of not me, not mine, not a self. And that's letting go. That's nekama, giving up. So that's one of the right intentions. That also has compassion in it. The emphasis is on letting go, but it's not devoid of compassion. Caring for oneself may have the perspective of not me, mine, or a self. I don't know. But the care is not really different from renunciation either. Does that make sense? They all kind of overlap. Caring is also a kind of giving. It's a kind of letting go. It's just a slight difference in uh, emphasis, I would say. And I would say that the caring for oneself during the panic attack is more uh, important if you have, um, if you find your mind is really out of balance and you're getting really distressed on top of the panic attack. So the panic is already panic, but it's more of a physiological thing that's been put, that's started and that's set in place. Um, if the mind observing that is very objective and you're aware of what's happening and you're staying quite calm with it, then that's fine. But if it's actually leading to kind of even more panic and catastrophizing, like this lady said, um, then it might be an idea to try to, you know, put your hand on your heart, maybe feel your heartbeat and tell yourself, you know, this is okay, my dear. I think it's really more of a seeing what's appropriate in the moment and trying things out for yourself. But it's good to know both options are available and then you can just see which one may work for you. I hope that makes some sense, but please write it again if that's not really what you meant to ask. I don't think most of these things are either ors. They're more like different approaches that you can use at different times. And it's not that one's better than another. It's more what is appropriate in this moment. And I think often we don't really ask ourselves, like, how am I doing right now? You know, we tend to push ourselves a little bit too far, but it really depends on your own development of the practice. And if you're comfortable just staying with something like a strong anxiety or a panic attack, then that's fine. It may be that after that it finishes, then there's the time for self-compassion and care. You know, extra rest. I mean, actually looking after yourself as opposed to sitting and meditating with a caring awareness. So, I mean, generally speaking, I think human beings are a lot more fragile than we would like to admit. And we tend to push ourselves a little bit too much. I think most of the time we could do with more TLC. And you can figure that one out by asking yourself how you treat a friend. You know, would you sort of expect the friend to then carry on with the day? Or would you sort of say to them, you know, what can I do for you? What would you like to eat most of all? You know, not just do you want whatever I can find in the fridge, but kind of make you a nourishing soup? You know, do you want extra time in bed? That's how you treat someone else. And that's definitely how you treat a child. So give yourself a little bit more TLC because then your mind starts to trust you. 
it's not just that you're indulging it's more like developing a good relationship with the mind because one of those things that can sabotage our practice more than anything is this voice inside this negative kind of inner critic inner tyrant that just constantly tries to disparage and discourage us on this path it's mara it's the voice of mara in the buddhist suttas so we have to say mara i know you So someone's saying the death meditation taught by Ajahn Pumali gives great joy and used often can be beneficial. Yes. So as I say, that was a bit of a kind of it was inspired by him and also another bikuni, which is lovely. You can find that one on the BSWA website and Ajahn Pumali's. You can also find it on the BSWA website somewhere. And you can find this one, too, now because we recorded it. So. It's true that it's a really good thing to do when we practice regularly. And someone asked earlier today, I think, about um, when to do anapana, when to do other practices, you know, how to combine them. And I think generally, I mean, Ajahn Brown didn't really maybe answer it directly, but advice I had from another really, really um, respected Kalyanamitta of mine is to, for example, on a long retreat, like a three month retreat, he said, keep a couple two or three reflections in your mind regularly as a sort of alternative to samadhi practice or to body contemplation whatever my main practice was so you might have your main practice but then you also have two or three others that you use from time to time to cultivate certain qualities maybe overcome certain hindrances or just uplift and inspire the mind because there's a sutta again in the anguttara nikaya that says when one's practicing samadhi, say anapana or metta, one should also give attention to two other things from time to time. One is equanimity. And Ajahn Brahm translates that as watching the trees grow. <laughs> but it, may, it basically means taking your foot off the pedal so you stop putting in any effort and you just sit back and watch. So you can either watch the trees grow in your mind, do nothing, just open awareness, or you can literally do nothing for a while during the day. And then the other one is um, rousing the mind. What do they call it? Pagaha, like uh, instigating energy. And that can, for that, we can use the death meditation. We can use Buddha Anusati, Dhamma Anusati, Sangha Anusati, reflections on the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. We can use metta if that's not one of our main, if we're not already practicing metta all the time. Um, we can use Chaganusati again, collecting our own virtue or chanting, doing some chanting, maybe even doing some fast walking meditation, something like that time in nature, something to energize the mind. So, yeah, on that retreat, when he'd given me that advice, I used to uh, focus, not focus, but practice mainly with the breath, if that was available to me, because I don't really decide. But, you know, I tend to incline that way. And then from time to time, I do some death meditation and some meta meditation and also reflecting on the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. And I found that really lovely. Is there a difference between the words Ajahn and Aya when used for nuns? No, the word Ajahn means teacher. I mean, yes, there's a difference. The word Ajahn means teacher, but it's a Thai word. It's not actually Pali. So... I think a lot of bhikkhunis don't use it because we're not really part of the Thai tradition. It's the word acharya in Pali. So you could all be called acharya, I guess, at least once your 10 years reigns. That's the official thing. But I don't like that because then it starts to feel like um, some kind of title, like because you're 10 years in the robes, now you're an ajahn, now you're a teacher. But that's not necessarily the case. Some people never teach or some people teach earlier, although it's better to wait until you're properly trained. But um, I just think it's become a bit of a title that everybody automatically gets after 10 years. And so most of the nuns I know don't use it. The word ayah is just venerable translated into Pali. So the word ayah and bante for monks are the same. So you can be venerable ajan somebody or ayah ajan somebody or ajan ayah or ajan bante. <laughs> but usually in Perth, we use venerable instead of ayah and bante just because it means we can all call each other the same thing. So I really like that because whether it's a monk or a non, even a novice or a fully ordained person, you're all venerable. So we call each other venerable. And what I really love is that we even call the junior ones venerable. So it reminds you that what they've done is venerable. 
it's not you as a person but it's a lovely way to remind you that this person has renounced a lot and that is worthy of veneration okay i fantasize about food in the evening sometimes any tips on working with hunger um yeah i mean it's completely normal to fantasize with about food in the evening so it's great really that that's happening because if it was so easy not to eat then you wouldn't have to practice restraint so the fact that you know you are kind of fantasizing and yet you're not eating is a very good thing so um that's one thing and i think you know it's just interesting to watch these fantasies especially when you do get to eat because you usually find that what you fantasized about is nowhere near as tasty as you thought it was <laughs> i remember on my first and maybe even second retreat i think second one i was in nepal Kathmandu. And I'd already been in India for a couple of years. And in India, there's no cake, really. You just get these little sickly, sickly milk sweets, but there's no chocolate. That's the first thing I had to give up. And there's really not no cake, at least in those days, 94 or so. They didn't make Western stuff. Uh, but in Kathmandu, <laughs> there were cakes everywhere. Big carrot cakes, chocolate, cake, all kinds of cakes, which anyway, I couldn't really afford. But um, so in my second retreat, I was thinking about this chocolate cake that I was going to get afterwards but then I went to get it and it was like you know it's quite a big bite out of my budget as well um but it was just like <laughs> nowhere near as nice as I'd imagined because actually the practice even when you're fantasizing you're also developing lots of qualities like contentment as well and you don't always realize that until after the retreat <laughs> that your sensual desire has actually lessened it's more likely that during retreat, your sensual desire will be highlighted because it's the anomaly in a sense. And, you know, we're coming face to face with the hindrances to meditation, hindrances in the sense of things to work with, as somebody rightly said earlier. And I was thinking actually about that question earlier, just to go off on a tangent slightly, that somebody said, um, you know, I find that working with the hindrances strengthens my practice. They're not necessarily negative things to overcome. And then I realized that... Um, yeah, you know, there can be, I mean, this is just my own little thought that came to me, so I might not be quite literally correct, but I think there might be some truth to it. Some people go very quickly into the practice of clearing a path through the hindrances, and then they might get into a deep meditation quite quickly. But because they haven't got like many, many, many years of working with hindrances and thinning them out in a sustainable way, that might close up again also quite quickly. Whereas I think if we're very familiar with our mind and we work with these hindrances for years and years and years, they generally stay at a lower level. So it might not be that you immediately get into deep meditation, like some people sort of forge your way through perhaps quickly, but it might be that your general level is much lower all the time because of the continued understanding and working with one's mind. So, I mean, and I do see that in, in meditators, you know, that sometimes people can have beginner's luck and then there are other very old meditators of 20, 30 years. They might have never had deep meditation yet, but they're generally extremely balanced and hardly ever, for example, get angry or lose their patience or, and there's a lot of wisdom in their life. So I think, you know, uh, there's something to be said for learning to work with the mind, whatever's presenting in the mind and not to measure or judge. You know, because there's no um, better path, really. There's no one right path and one lesser path. And even if you do get into some deep meditation or get close, you'll find that if you haven't got that familiarity with working with these strong emotions that can arise, you will still have to do that work. There's no way around it. You know, there's no way to bypass that. So I do think, anyway, that was sort of on a tangent, but I don't know if that made any sense to anyone here. Um, <clears throat> okay. If feeling overwhelmed by physical pain, could sound be used as my object for meditation, for example, music? I know the best is using Vedana, but some days, like today, the pain is just too much. Hmm, there's a good question. See, I don't know about that. Um, I think you can be creative, definitely. Um, for me personally, I'm very musical, like so musical that that was going to be my 
career <laughs> before. I mean, like not a professional, um, like anything refined. I was a rock singer. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so for me, um, giving up music, was really really good for my practice because as soon as I hear any song it would just stay in my mind for days uh, because I just pick up the tune immediately and I get really like really involved with it so for me music isn't very helpful it depends what kind it is I guess like if something's really really peaceful and relaxing then maybe um when the pain is too much, what else could you do? I mean, perhaps you could do some chanting, that's music, but then you're actively engaged. And also that kind of um, chanting music <laughs> is, um, is the Dhamma teachings, right? So you could listen to some chanting or you could even do some chanting. That might be a nice little break from the pain. I mean, there's other ways of working with chronic physical pain. Um, such as keeping the mind in any part of the body, maybe the skin, maybe the palms of the hands or the soles of the feet, maybe the top of the head, and just resting your attention really, really lightly there so that you're not avoiding the really strong pain, but you're actually making the focus or making the, the subtle parts of the body your main object. And so it gives it a kind of container a kind of wider context so that you're not only getting sucked into the really difficult stuff but it really depends on you and what you're experiencing I would say just experiment but eventually of course um, the best way when you've got the strength of mind is to fully fully embrace that pain no matter how difficult it is and see if you can change your relationship with it and sometimes it really is true that it can just disappear the problem with saying that is that then we try all sorts of tricks to make it disappear and that doesn't work <laughs> so yeah I'm sorry to hear that another thing you could try is meta because meta does tend to have a pleasantness about it and it does tend to generate um, pleasant feelings in the body and again you might not experience that everywhere obviously especially if you've got strong pains in certain parts but you might have a general sense of softening around the pain and also some pleasant or subtler sensations in other parts of the body so you could try that as well and if all else fails self-compassion you know really put your hand on your heart talk to yourself calm yourself be kind to yourself and also relax um, <clears throat> lying down might help you can do a lot of lying down meditation at first you might fall asleep but if you keep lying down for hours and hours and hours eventually you will wake up and you might find that's quite a comfortable posture to be in but um i don't know because i'm not in your body but i would just say <clears throat> try anything you can and give yourself a lot of encouragement because it takes courage and it takes strength of mind to show up and to and to stay present so you don't have to be present with it all the time <clears throat> Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Dear Vanchanda, often when I meditate, I feel like I'm going deeper and deeper and suddenly there are some images in my head. Sometimes these are beautiful landscapes and it feels peaceful. Other times there are sentences or images that are disturbing. Do you have any suggestion on how to deal with them? <laughs> Thank you for your comment. Um, so yeah, so these kind of images and the um, sentences or disturbing things come when the mind is starting to get peaceful, like it's starting to um, become stronger, more powerful, and the body's starting to fade a little bit, or perhaps your mind is, you know, becoming calm, but it's not, uh, they're not yet still or powerful enough to follow. So it's usually better just to let them be there but stay with your main object of meditation at this stage. So if you're with the breath, then just be with the breath, let them be there, but don't get too distracted by them at this stage, because if they're really useful kind of visions or um, obviously some are disturbing, so you can just let those fall away from your awareness. But if there are things like beautiful landscapes, then at some point um, the beauty might grow and then you'll be drawn into a certain part of that beautiful landscape. Something like this happened to me <clears throat> a couple of rains ago that a landscape came up and it was actually 
where I was living, it was of Oxford, but it was much more beautiful than it usually looks. It was like a beautiful path full of like extremely green foliage and just so beautiful. And in my mind, it was a shame in a sense, because in my mind, um, I'd heard that, you know, landscapes are not really very good narrators to follow because it's too complicated. And I didn't make any decisions, nothing. But my mind, there was almost like this magnetic, really strong pull away from that path because it was like this path that was trying to pull me down it. And there was this equally strong force pulling me the opposite way, which was really interesting to me because that was definitely some kind of conditioning or maybe some kind of fear. But at the time, I actually didn't feel any fear. So it was really interesting. But I think what it was showing is that it's just not ready yet to follow. So then I told Ajahn Brahm and he said, next time, just let yourself go there. I, mean, I could definitely feel if I went there, I was going to lose myself in that path. But uh, that I guess somehow the intellect got involved, um, even though it was nonverbal. And the whole thing kind of retracted. So I think it's just that these things need a little bit more time. And um, as for the other disturbing things, don't worry about those at all. I mean, the mind's full of disturbing things, isn't it? All the time. So I think so. So, <laughs> so if the have was in meditation, don't worry. Just, just try not to get too distracted at this stage. You're doing fine and the perception is changing. You know, it's becoming a little bit more creative. Sometimes Ajahn Brahm calls that like perception taking wings. It's getting out of its confinement of the sort of things it normally conjures up and sees so yeah I hope that helps but if there is a very beautiful scene and there's something in that scene that's particularly compelling like a dewdrop on a leaf that's shiny and lovely then you might want to see if the mind inclines to that but just be very careful at this kind of stage because if you do anything it's so subtle you'll just disturb the whole thing mm -hmm. What is the TFL you referred to? Hmm, TFL? Did I? I don't know what that is, actually. What is the TFL I referred to? Maybe you could mention when I referred to that because I can't figure out that at the moment. If anybody else thinks they know, they can write me a message. Um, Okay, so there's a follow-up question from, um, just checking here, that's from, okay. Should I, okay, so the same person with pain is saying, should I use a phrase like, may all be free from suffering? It's head pain, so chanting is out, okay. Yeah, um, I wouldn't worry about others, I would think about yourself at that point. So yeah, you can say a phrase like that to yourself if you wish. Or may I fully embrace this pain? May I develop contentment with this pain? You don't have to focus it on pain. Just see what really speaks to you and what would be kind for you to say to yourself. That's what I would try. <laughs> so there's questions about the future, longer retreats in the future. If you can organize them and invite me and Ajahn, then it's possible. <laughs> Is the time of death a good moment to be aware for insight to arise? Is it possible to see impermanence and not self directly when one is dying, when all is literally falling apart? I think it is actually, especially if you've been training your mind to look in that direction most of your life. It's definitely possible. And actually, one of the little chants that I noted down before I came to this was um, what they call the funeral chanting. And it actually says, um, Anichavata Sankara Upadwaya Dhammino Upajitwa Nirujanti Te Sam Upasamosuko. And that's actually chanted at funerals. It means something like all conditioned things are impermanent, their nature is to arise and pass away. Having arisen, they cease. And in their ceasing is the bliss of peace. That's my translation, but I like that translation. Te sam upasamo sukho. It means the bliss of peace. Upasama is like peace and sukha is bliss or happiness. 
So all conditioned things are impermanent. Their nature is to arise and pass away. Having arisen, they cease. And in their ceasing is the bliss of peace. So imagine if you have a heavy body, if you have, you know, a really painful, sickly, tired body that you can barely move anymore, that maybe doesn't speak anymore, can't eat anymore. What a relief it's going to be when the mind starts to separate from that body and actually get some freedom and starts to become light and the body is just, you know, left aside. Just the very fact that we stop clinging to that body, right, is a good insight to have into how the end of craving leads to freedom, freedom from wanting, right? Craving is the cause of suffering. It's when we can't let go that we suffer so much. So yes, I do think it's possible to be, uh, for insight to arise. And also, even if you haven't developed deep meditations into things like nimittas and jhanas, it's possible that they can arise too, because at the time of death, guess what many people see in their near-death experiences? They see the light. And they start traveling towards this light. And I've listened to a few talks. You can find them on the internet of people who've nearly died. And then they, or they did die, clinically they died. And they saw what was happening to their body while they, was de while they were dead. And then they started traveling towards a light. And one person I saw actually said that then he was in a field after that, like a field full of wildflowers. And then uh, there was a cloud above floating and he felt so blissful, so peaceful, the most beautiful field in the world. And then a hand came out of the cloud. <laughs> it sounds really crazy, right? The hand came out of the cloud and then um, took his hand and, tried, and started to pull him up. But then he was told, no, no, it's not your time yet. And then he went back down. I thought that was kind of interesting because it changed this man's life completely. And he was a Christian. So for him, you know, that was complete concrete proof of the heaven, of heaven. And I think in a way, you know, whatever we have in our mind is likely to arise. It's almost like we create these things according to our beliefs. But he did see a light and then he went towards this um, heaven realm and he came back to earth and talked about it. And he said, you know, he just loves people in his life, like love as a verb. He just takes care of people. He just gives his love to everyone in his life and the way he talked about his wife was very beautiful he kept saying I love my wife she's here now and she supported me all these years and he obviously had something there but the difference with someone who practices on the Buddhist path is that we've been primed to look in the direction of impermanence suffering and non-self so if something like a light happens or the mind becomes very peaceful very still it may be the case that you then would look in that direction. You'd remember the Buddha's teachings and so insight could arise. I mean, who knows, right? This is what I've understood. This is partly what I've thought about and partly what I've heard from others who've either remembered past lives or who've spoken to people with these experiences or just have their own insight into that. So, yeah, I do think that it's an opportunity for great insight to arise. I mean, if you're going to let go, at some point, then when better than death? If you haven't managed all your life, then at least at death, you've got another chance. <laughs> so hopefully, oh my goodness, nine new messages. Oh, uh, okay. All right, yeah, yeah. So they're all about what TLC means. So TLC, not TFC, right. So I might have said TLC, tender loving care. So hopefully that answered that one. And then there's one more question. So if anyone needs to leave, Please do. I guess you did already. There's only one more question. Oh, it's not a question. This talk was really what I needed tonight. Thank you. Very good. And thank you for everybody's TLC towards both myself and Ajahn Brown and towards yourselves and towards each other and our wonderful co-hosts as well for all your care and uh, keeping this place a very safe space for everybody. So thank you and enjoy dying into your sleep, <laughs> practicing a bit of loving kindness. Good night, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>